to uh, session number three on night number two of our Belteshazzar Ancient Grand Vizier series. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's been some pretty mind-blowing stuff already, uh, looking at the prophecies and stories of the ancient world, uh, specifically found in the book of Daniel. And it's been a, uh, a real um, privilege to have Dad along, uh, my dad along, to share with us these presentations and I hope that you've been blessed. Make sure if you have any questions to uh, talk to him afterwards, uh, or even, you know, if they're really good, we might even share those questions with everyone and uh, do a bit of a question time. Who knows? We'll see how, how that goes. If we have questions, let us know. Um, this morning we had a lot more people here because it was our, our, our regular church service. Uh, we want to thank you for bearing with us in regards to the ticketing. Uh, it was our first time doing that uh, with the full full church service. We've heard a lot of feedback. Uh, we've learned uh, some lessons. Overall, I think we did okay for our first time, but definitely there was some there was some some teething problems, and so we're working those out. Uh, and hopefully, uh, watch this space regarding the next uh, the next uh, Saturday morning session, which will probably be another hectic one uh, as well. It might be slightly different. Just. We're just testing this out. You guys are our guinea pigs. We appreciate your, uh, we appreciate your understanding in regards to that. <laughs> um, also, just in regards to the ticketing, make sure you're please sitting in in the space given to you on the ticket, uh, so we don't have any awkward situations regarding that. Now, these videos are being live streamed. Uh, we have kind of been keeping that a little bit on more on the uh, on the download because we would prefer for people to be here. Uh, but if you would like, if 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 you would like to watch uh, the videos afterwards. Uh, they are available on our, not on our church's YouTube, but our church's other YouTube channel called The Prophetic Code Logan Reserve. For those of you who remember last year, we ran the Prophetic Code series. We met many of you through that. Uh, that was where we streamed those videos. It's all on that same site as well. We are currently streaming. We've had a little bit of issues with the internet, and so we may, if the, if the internet still plays up, we may just record and then upload them later so you can get a clearer viewing experience, and you can share these with your friends. Just bear in mind, the streams, when they finish, uh, they usually disappear off of YouTube for a couple hours and then come back. Uh, so right afterwards, if you're looking for the stream and you can't find it, it'll come back in, uh, in a couple hours' time. So just have a bit of patience in regards to that. I don't know why YouTube does that. It's really weird. Anyway. Tonight we have another free offer, uh, A King, A Dream, and You, uh, by, it's a little book, basically based on what we heard this morning. Great little book to read, go a little bit deeper, uh, review what, uh, what uh, Dad talked about this morning, uh, and a great one to share with your friends. If you've enjoyed what you, what you liked, uh, if, if you enjoyed what you heard uh, this morning, just take this little book. Share it with your share it with your friend. They can read it, or you can send them the link of the uh, of the of the video. So, a king and dream in you by Gary Kent, another presenter on uh, international presenter on these topics, a friend of Dad's, and um, yeah, they have a passion for uh, sharing the prophecies of the Bible because they really do show a um, a powerful God who we can trust and 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 believe in. Continuing series, yes, tomorrow night we have another program, so same time, same place tomorrow night, and it, the program tomorrow night will be Psychopath to Saint. We touched on a bit on the psychology of Nebuchadnezzar this morning, we're really going to go into it uh, next week, uh, sorry, tomorrow night, and so bring your friends, uh, it's been so nice to meet so many new people, uh, bring your friends along to that. Those are, that's everything from me, I'm fairly certain you don't want to hear from me. There's a much more interesting guy about to talk, so I'll hand it over to Dad. Well, thanks, Harley. Uh, it's great to be here once again um, and to be able to share with you from the book of Daniel. Super excited about tonight's subject, and uh, we're going to get into it. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we have this privilege of being able to spend this time reading and studying the Bible together. We pray that as we... Share together here this evening that you'll send your Holy Spirit to guide us once again, to help us to understand more clearly uh, what your word teaches and to help us to apply it to our lives in a practical way so that we can live for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This evening's subject, image to the beast. Why is this not working? Maybe if I switch it on. There we go. There we go. The greatest historical showdown of all time. We spoke a little bit about this morning, and uh, Harley just mentioned it just now, 
about Nebuchadnezzar and how he was a bit of a psycho, wasn't he? We're going to see more of that in today's Bible study, and we're going to look at more of the reasons for that. So we looked at a number of different uh, potential reasons for you know, what really messed with his head and what really broke him as an individual as far as the way his thinking went. And there are more reasons that we're going to look at, but one of them that we're going to pick up on today is paranoia. Okay, so when we think about the ancient emperors and kings and rulers of the ancient world, we need to understand that the government existed just in one individual. And because the government existed in one individual and everybody pledged their allegiance to that one individual, then to create a change of government, it was very easy. All you had to do was take just one life. And as a result of that, the emperors of the past lived under the constant pressure of assassination plots. Every day of their life, they would wake up thinking, who is going to try and assassinate me today? If you look at the Persians, for instance, the, uh, the, or, or the Assyrians, the Rabshakeh that we can read about in the Assyrians was the cupbearer. And he was the most important official that there was. And his job was to guard the king's cup that he drank from. It was never to be out of his sight, never to be out of his possession, so that nobody could ever get any poison into it. He had to be the, the most trusted person that there was in the empire. The cupbearer often held a position as, uh, as, as, as big as the prime minister or the grand vizier. This was the kind of paranoia that they lived in and their survival depended on the level of paranoia that they were able to maintain on a daily basis. Now, I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. If you're living under that kind of pressure, what's that actually going to do to you? What's that going to do to your psyche as an individual? Now, let's go to the story of Nebuchadnezzar and let's pick up from where we left off this morning. This morning we left off in Daniel chapter 2, and in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. This is something that takes place, the events of this chapter take place on a very, very public, uh, public basis, because what happens is that Nebuchadnezzar is not able to remember his dream. Not only is he not able to remember it, he can't have it interpreted. And as a result of that, he decrees that the entire cabinet is destroyed all of their families, this is the Babylonian cabinet, all of their families, and that their houses are turned into a pile of dung. The decree begins to be carried out before it is brought to an end by this young kid who's probably about 18 years old at the time. One of the students in the schools of Babylon, a man by the name of Daniel who is called Belteshazzar. Now, this is not something that took place in a corner. This was something that was very well known. You don't go and do something as radical as what Nebuchadnezzar was doing without the whole empire hearing about it. And we say, well, how did the whole empire hear about it? They didn't have Twitter back then. No, they didn't have Twitter. They had actually something that was more effective than Twitter. They had gossip. You can guarantee that that message of what had happened and how this young kid from this micro-nation who served this God, and this God ruled over a tiny nation, this God called Yahweh, had actually done something that no one in Babylon had been able to do. And that, you know, particularly Bel had not been able, the Babylonian God Bel hadn't been able to come through on this one. But Daniel had, and suddenly, this is a disaster for Nebuchadnezzar, on a scale that we fail to even begin to imagine today. Now, I want you to think about it. Let's put yourself in Nebuchadnezzar's shoes for a moment. It's been very public. He can't deny what has happened. And so he can't turn around and just sort of execute Daniel for being able to, well, tell him what he had dreamed several nights before. No, you can't do that because that's going to make you, that, that's going to make you look like a terrible, terrible tyrant. If you don't already look like that already, it's going to make you look much worse. And so Daniel, yes, he's going to be exalted in the empire, no question about that, and receive the rewards that have been promised to him. But at the same time, Daniel has given a vision of an image with four different metals in it, gold, silver, brass, iron, 
And this image proclaims the end of the Babylonian Empire. And so this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has had, this prophetic dream that has been, has been interpreted in the most supernatural way that the ancients have ever seen, has now become the greatest tool for anybody who wants to raise an insurrection against Babylon. You see, all they have to do is to convince their followers, well, you know what? I am the silver. Nebuchadnezzar, yes, he's the gold, but I am the silver, so you need to be following me. This is a strategic, a political strategic disaster for Nebuchadnezzar on an unimaginable scale. We're going to find out that it actually turns into quite a disaster a little bit further on when we look at the historical background of what actually takes place in this next chapter. But before we do that, we're going to look at Nebuchadnezzar's solution How does he go about dealing with the problem of Daniel chapter 3? How does he deal with, sorry, Daniel chapter 2? How does he deal with a prophecy that has proclaimed an end to his empire? Well, let's go to Daniel chapter 3 and we'll find out exactly how Nebuchadnezzar decides to deal with this. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was... 30 meters, well it says here three score cubits, we'll call it 30 meters, and the breadth thereof six cubits, he set it up in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. Let's stop there for a moment, and before we go any further, does anybody see a correlation between Daniel 2 and Daniel 3? What do we have in Daniel 2? An image, what's it made out of? Four different metals, then feet of iron and clay. Then you come to chapter 3, what's this image made out of? What is the message that Nebuchadnezzar is trying to proclaim? My kingdom will reign forever. You don't need to worry about Yahweh and Yahweh's prophecy. Yahweh's prophecy, that comes from a very minor nation and we have conquered that nation. So you don't need to worry about that God or the message of that God. And you certainly don't need to start thinking about raising an insurrection against me because I'll put that insurrection down and this empire will last forever. Now we need to understand the psyche of the ancients and how they thought, particularly in relationship to the gods that they served. You see, when one nation in those days overcome and overtook another nation, In their minds, this was not just a war between nations, it was a war between the gods. And so in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, if my gods are able to overcome your gods, then my gods are greater than your gods, and my God has overcome Yahweh. So we don't need to worry about Yahweh. Okay, he might have, he might have explained this prophecy, but we don't, he's not a threat. Don't be, don't be thinking of Yahweh as any kind of threat because really uh, he's a conquered God. And well, actually, uh, our God, Bel here, um, he's the God that we need to be focusing in on. But he decides he's going to do something about this and he decides he's actually going to launch a new God right here and he's going to have a great ceremony uh, to launch this particular new God. And so he creates this god, and this god is made out of solid gold. It is a direct contrast to the prophecy that you have in Daniel chapter 2. It is a strategic move because Nebuchadnezzar is trying to deal with the rebellious elements that are in his empire. He's trying to communicate to his old whole empire, I'm going to be around for a very, very long time indeed. And as a part of this, he gathers together everyone who is anyone Within the empire, the Bible says in verse 2, that Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of all the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of all the provinces were gathered together under the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So what does Nebuchadnezzar do at this particular point? Well, he gathers everyone who is anyone. And what are they going to do when they come to the plain of Jura where he has set up this new image? It's not just about launching a new god. This god, this image is a symbol of the Babylonian Empire. 
And by swearing allegiance and worshipping this symbol of the Babylonian Empire, they are swearing their allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar himself. He is dealing with the problem that he was handed in chapter 2, and he's dealing with it in a most dramatic way. You think about a golden image that is 30 meters tall. That is massive. Uh, someone down at Coffs Harbor made an air-filled version of the Daniel 2 one, and he made it to the Daniel 3 size and specifications. We're running a uh, seminar like this once in Sydney. We had a big car park like yours, and we set it up. You know, and it just towered. You'd be driving down the freeway like way, many kilometers away, and you just see this thing towering up in the air. It was uh, quite a logistical nightmare to keep it up, but, you know, because you get, you get 10 minutes of rain, and now there's a ton of water sitting on this thing. Uh, it was quite the challenge, but it was just remarkable. And uh, people all over Sydney were talking about it. Even the media was there, and it created quite the stir. You can imagine that this is not an air-filled image made out of, you know, a very light canvas. This thing was made out of gold. The reflected light would have been able to have been seen from over the horizon when the sun was hitting it. This was a, would have dominated everybody's attention when they have gathered around. And that was Nebuchadnezzar's plan. His plan was to awe the whole empire and all the representatives of the empire with the wealth and the splendor and the power of the Babylonian empire. That was the message that he was sending out. Let's uh, continue on as we read here in the story. Herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that whatever time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music that you fall down and worship the golden image that the king has set up. And whoever doesn't fall down and worship the same hour will be thrown into the middle of a burning, fiery furnace. So, okay, Nebuchadnezzar hasn't changed a whole lot, has he? No, not at all. He's gotten rid of chapter two and now he's into the image of chapter three and he's like okay everybody's going to gather together the representatives of the entire empire are going to go going to be here they are going to swear allegiance to me by worshiping the god that i have created the bible says therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the corn at the flute the sat the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people of the nations and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Except there was one problem. You see, when we come to verse 8, the Bible says, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near. And what did the Chaldeans do? What does it say right there? Some of you are following along. They accused who? The Jews. Why would they be accusing the Jews? Who were the Chaldeans? We covered this already. Who were the Chaldeans? That's his family. And we have some Jews here. We're going to find out their names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are very close friends of Daniel. And they were the same close friends of Daniel that refused to compromise back in chapter 1. And they have been promoted in the empire. And they are standing up. When everybody else is bowing down to worship this particular image, and it's the Chaldeans who are the first to go rushing off to Nebuchadnezzar, like, ah, those Jews, they're still standing up. Why do you think the Chaldeans were so keen to do that? Yeah, exactly. You see, these Jews were in the position that they felt that they deserved because they were Nebuchadnezzar's family. They were his tribe. A lot of jealousy happening here at this particular time period. And of course, as, as we continue on down through here, um, <clears throat> they, they accused the Jews and they spoke to the king in verse 9 and said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, live forever. Um, haven't you made this decree that whoever, verse 11, doesn't fall down and worships, that he would be cast into the middle of a burning, fiery furnace? Notice what it says in verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded you. They do not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Notice where they start right there. They don't regard you. They are raising insurrection against you in the crowd right here in front of you. 
That's pretty full on, isn't it? Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and his fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, this is interesting here at this particular point, because what happens next is truly bizarre. You see, Nebuchadnezzar has gathered everybody together. The representatives of the entire empire are there. The music has played. The launch has happened. And now, his rulers that he has over the province of Babylon. I mean, these are not from some far-flung district. They are ruling right there in the province of Babylon. They've suddenly really embarrassed him, haven't they? And right here, you get a little bit of an inkling of how effective these young men had been in their position. Because Nebuchadnezzar offers them something. He's like, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll restart everything. We we will just start back over again. Now, I want you to think about this. Imagine that you are an events planner, and you have planned a massive event, and there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have turned up at the event and you launch the event, and then something goes wrong, and you have to come out on stage and say, look, sorry guys, uh, didn't go according to plan, there was a little bit of a mess up over here, what we're going to do is just start all over from scratch again. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Yeah? Now think about this, you are the emperor who has decreed death on anybody who does not bow down, and now you are going to show your weak side by starting that all over again, dealing with that kind of embarrassment against people who are openly uh, performing insurrection right in front of you in the crowd, to your face. For Nebuchadnezzar to extend that kind of grace demonstrates just how valuable these young men were in the empire. What's interesting is what it goes on to say here. Because the issue, as we find here, is all about worship. Conflict over worship. Where are we? Verse 15, now if you're ready, whatever whatever time you hear the sound of the cornet, the hoop, the the, the harp, the sackbut, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image which I have made, good. But if you worship not, you will be cast the same hour into the middle of the burning fiery furnace, and who is the God who shall deliver you? That's a challenge there, isn't it? Notice here that this challenge has now, it has now left the realm of this earth. This is not just about a debate over political entities. Nebuchadnezzar has gone celestial and he's like, this is between the gods. That's it. Let's stop arguing about the politics here on this earth. Let's, let's, we're going to talk about the gods. And there is no way in a million years that your tiny god from your tiny nation that has already been decisively conquered a number of times, and you have ended up here as captives, there is no way that that God is ever going to be able to deal with the gods of Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar has taken it immediately into the spiritual, the celestial realm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful. That's old English right there. It means stressed out. We're not stressed out in answering you in this matter. I don't know about you, but if I was there at that time, yeah, I'd be pretty stressed out. Yeah? Your life is on the line. But they weren't stressed out. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. And if not, be it known unto you, O king, we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Okay. Let's, let's, let's take a, a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look at what is taking place here. On night one, we mentioned that Satan had the world almost where he wanted it. Isn't that so? It was almost there. There was just a couple of individuals that were standing in his way, and three of those individuals were these three teenagers that we have here. They're probably about 30 years old by the time that this happened. I'll look at the historical evidence for that in a moment. 
But they're just these three young men, and they have been refusing to compromise. And they are just not compromising, and not compromising, and not compromising. And as a result of that, the knowledge of God is staying in the world, and there are still worshippers of God, and Satan still can't go back to heaven and proclaim himself the ruler over everyone that's on the, world, on the earth. So he comes up with this scheme. He's like, okay, let's get them killed off. Let's, let's get Nebuchadnezzar so freaked out over Daniel chapter 2. Where God, you know, he stepped in and, and, and pulled the swifty. Well, let's turn that back on God. You know, let's use what God did in Daniel 2. This is God and Satan in controversy with each other now. Let's use what God did in Daniel chapter 2 to actually kill God's followers so that they're not alive anymore, so that I can go to heaven and proclaim myself the ruler of everyone that is on planet Earth. You know, this is a number of years down the track since those earlier events, probably 10 years down the track since those earlier events that took place and God's people have been in captivity. Many of them are starting to blend into the Babylonian society. They are speaking the Chaldean language. They are just becoming kind of Babylonian and he's got high hopes. We're not even going to have a remnant left. Let's get these guys killed off and let's do it publicly. And let's make a public display of it. You can see what Satan is thinking here, can't you? And so you have this uh, whole situation that arises right here. Now think about yourself for a moment. Let's say that you are one of the uh, rulers of one of the provinces. You have an official position somewhere from some far-flung area of the Babylonian Empire. And you have been required to come and swear your allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar and to the new God that he is setting up. And you're there and uh, you're a part of that crowd and everybody is fixated on this amazing creation that Nebuchadnezzar has. And believe me, Nebuchadnezzar was an, an, an incredibly creative person. And the world's greatest ancient builder. So this would not have been anything shabby. It would have been absolutely spectacular. And so you're standing there. The attention of that whole crowd would have been focused on that image. The music plays. Everybody bows down. And suddenly there's three people standing up. Now where's your attention? It's on these three guys. You'd be want to know what's going to happen here. What's Nebuchadnezzar going to do about it? This is, this is public defiance of the emperor in front of everybody. So now is where is your attention been focused? It's gone off of the image and now it's focused on these guys. And sometimes I wonder whether Satan stopped at that particular point and thought, Oh no, that's not exactly what I had in mind. I didn't exactly have in mind that everybody would be looking at the followers of God right now. Maybe I've overreached myself a little bit. Well, Nebuchadnezzar does something interesting. The Bible says in verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. We, this is a bit of a, a common theme so far, isn't it? He's full of fury, and the form of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he spoke and commanded that the fiery furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. What's going on here? Nebuchadnezzar is getting nervous, isn't he? He's come across Yahweh before, hasn't he? He's seen the power of Yahweh displayed, and he's like, okay, we need to make sure that no one can survive this. Isn't that so? Yeah, he's, he's come again, up against this God before, and suddenly he's worried. He's like, okay, let's make it seven times hotter than it has ever been heated before. And every degree that he raised the temperature of that furnace by was a degree more in the glory that was going to come to God later. And so they just start pumping it up and pumping it up. No doubt they had a furnace there for building the image. They would have needed to be able to deal with a lot of metal in building that image. And so no doubt they had a furnace right there that was ready and available for this purpose. The Bible says in verse 20, he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the burning fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, their hats, their other garments, and were thrown into the middle of the burning fiery furnace. When we read this uh, passage right here, we find that, you know, when they are thrown in here, that they don't even bother with anything. They just, they just tie them up. It's like, we're going to throw you in there. With everything. The Bible says, verse 22, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, 
and the furnace exceedingly hot. The flame of the fire killed those men that carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Friends, this was no fire-walking trick that we are going to read about right here. There was so much radiant heat coming out of the mouth of the furnace that the soldiers who threw them in could not survive just the radiant heat. Now, fire is something we know a lot about in Australia, right? We deal with fire, and we know how fire kills, and nearly all of the people who die in fire in Australia die from smoke inhalation. These guys died from radiant heat. That's a lot of heat. There's no fire walking trick that is taking place here, but I love what happens as this passage progresses. You see, the Bible says, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell down into the middle of the burning fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in a hurry and spoke and said to his counselors, didn't we throw three men into the middle of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, true, O king. And he answered and said, lo, I see four men loose, walking in the middle of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Wow. Think about this. Up until this particular point, how many people on earth had seen Jesus? Think about that for a moment. You've got Abraham. You've got Moses. You've got Adam and Eve. Not too many, right? And here you've got Nebuchadnezzar. He's an out and out pagan, a total psycho, ruler of Satan's emperor, and he gets to see Jesus, along with the three worthies. You know, when you think about what is taking place here, it's absolutely remarkable. You think of Satan, you know, standing back like, I have, I've, I've, I've got these guys, I'm going to destroy them, I'm going to kill them, and suddenly, suddenly then, you know, everybody's focus turns from the image that he has to these three men is like, ah, uh, this could go badly. But think about yourself if you were in the crowd when all of this was happening. Put yourself in that crowd for a moment once again. You're there. The image is amazing. Mind-blowing. The music is incredible. You fall down and worship, but then there's these three guys that are standing up. And so now you're looking at that like, oh, this is going to be an interesting story to tell when I go home. We get to see an execution. Now... Okay, at this particular point, we need to be a little bit honest with ourselves. If you were in the crowd, the execution, it'd be one of those kind of things that you really don't want to see. Because what you see cannot be unseen. But at the same time, you would have watched. That's human nature. It would have been one of those spectacles that's like, I can't turn my eyes away from this. You see, what is more exciting to go home and talk about? What is more exciting to even experience? Worshipping a golden image or watching an execution? Human nature is pretty broken and pretty corrupt. And if we're honest with ourselves, there would have been something within us that would have said, we have to see this. And when, when it moves from being all about worshipping the image to a public execution that is about to take place, you know that everybody at this point, they've forgotten the image, haven't they? They're not even thinking about the image. And then you've got this situation where these guys are tied up and they're thrown in and suddenly they're walking around in the fire. They're not even coming out. They're just walking around in the fire. There is four of them. Jesus himself is there. Wow. You know, you stop and think about that for a moment. And you think about some of the things that we go through in our life. It shows you just how much Jesus cares for each individual person on this planet. Isn't that so? That he was prepared to leave the courts of heaven and come down to this earth and stand there in the fire with those guys. 
The only thing that got burnt was the Babylonian ropes that were tying them up. And so what does Nebuchadnezzar do? He's looking in there, and there's these four guys walking around. What would you do? The Bible says, he, uh, they answered and said, yep, we threw three men in there. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. Not too near. He didn't want to die. <clears throat> and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the middle of the fire. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together. If you were in that crowd, what would you do now? What would you do? You'd be, you, would be, you would be gathering together to see what happened, wouldn't you? Being gathered together, they saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither, did their, neither, neither were their coats changed nor the smell of fire had come upon them. They didn't even smell like smoke. You know, how, you know how anything that you are wearing when you are working, you know, putting out a bushfire or something or other, your clothes, they smell of smoke. You're at a campfire out camping. Your clothes have that smoky smell. They didn't even smell like smoke. How do they know this? Well, they obviously checked them out very, very carefully. They were getting up close. They were touching their clothes. They were having a sniff. That would be a little bit weird, wouldn't it? Don't know about you, someone comes up and wants to sniff my clothes. We're like, ooh, what's going on here? A little bit weird. But when you've seen something like this, you know that you have a story that you have to take back with you. Nebuchadnezzar's intention, Satan's intention with all of this, was that they would take back a story that his empire, the Babylonian Empire, was the greatest empire the world had ever seen, that it was an empire that would last forever, and you did not need to worry about raising any insurrection against this empire uh, based on Daniel chapter 2 or Yahweh's prophecy, because Yahweh was a minor god from a tiny micronation. You don't need to worry about Yahweh. Babylon, Bel, Marduk, these guys are going to last forever. And as all of those people went home, what was the story that they were carrying with them? They were carrying a story. There's a God that lives down there in Judah who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Babylonian gods and come off victorious. And his name is Yahweh. That's quite the story to share, isn't it? Satan, at this particular time, he knows he's really, really overreached himself very, very badly. And this has gone very, very badly for him. Notice what it says. Then Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said... Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and has delivered his servants and trusted in him and has changed the king's word and has yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people and nation and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, here it comes again, shall be cut in pieces, their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now, we're going to talk about some historical uh, uh, points here in just a moment. But before we do, I just, want to, I just want you to catch this point here. That these three young men were no different from any of us. And Jesus would rather leave the courts of heaven and come to this earth than to see you fall under the temptations of Satan. That's how much he cares for you. And that's how much he is that is how far he is prepared to go for you as an individual. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, some historical aspects. We have to ask ourselves the question, you know, is there any actual historical basis for the story that we have been reading about right here? You know, did anybody come along and start an insurrection against Nebuchadnezzar? And does that insurrection in any way relate to the story that we've been looking at right here? Well, we're going to look at the evidence and find out. There was a major insurrection that was raised against Nebuchadnezzar, a civil war. It was led by Nabu Ahi Bullet. In the tenth year, the king of Akkad was in his own land. In the fourth month of Kislev to the month of Tebet, there was a rebellion in Akkad. This is Babylon. With arms, he slew many of his own army. His own hand captured his enemy. That's a story of a rebellion that is breaking out in his own land. Okay, so we've got to, as, as historians, we have to act a little bit like uh, detectives and we have to piece the pieces together to see what is going on. 
And so if we continue on from here, uh, after the revolt has been put down in 595 BC, what does Nebuchadnezzar do left? Do, do next? Well, there's a military buildup in the west, and the Babylonian army marches through the western provinces in 594 BC. So the western provinces was where this rebellion had broken out, and he had put down the rebellion, and then he does a display of force. That's kind of a smart thing to do. If you've had a rebellion there, you put it down, you get a massive army together, and you march it through those provinces just to show everybody, yeah, you're never ever going to survive against the Babylonians. The question we have to ask ourselves is this. Did someone in the West, in those Western provinces, was there someone over there? Was this guy here, uh, Nabu Ahibul, did he stand up and say, okay, you know what, I'm the silver. You know, I'm the, I'm the silver in this whole equation. Well, let's look at what happens. That's 594 BC. What, if, what does Nebuchadnezzar do the next year? Well, the next year, which is 593 BC, we know that Zedekiah... The king of Jerusalem goes to Babylon to swear a loyalty oath to Nebuchadnezzar. You can read about that in Jeremiah 51, uh, right there. Okay, now let's think about this for a moment, because some people ask the question, they're like, weren't all of the Jews captives in Babylon at this particular time? And what you need to remember is that Nebuchadnezzar captured the city of Jerusalem three times. Daniel was taken captive in the first time. But he kind of left the city there. It was a wealthy city. It was good for trade. It was good to have it there as a part of his empire. It was a brood of a fortress. It was a great buffer city against his great rival down in the south being Egypt and so he kind of wanted to keep it there but it turned out to be very very rebellious and Zedekiah well he was uh, as rebellious as the rest of them and so eventually he was going to go down there and completely destroy it and burn it and just completely wipe it out but you find here that Zedekiah goes to Babylon to swear a loyalty oath to Nebuchadnezzar let me ask you this question. Who was it that was invited to the dedication or the launch of the golden image? All the rulers of all the provinces. Zedekiah was a vassal king. Him and all of his officials would have been required to be at this particular event to swear their, their loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar. And, and why would it be happening at this particular point in history? Well, two years before there was a revolt. The year after that, Nebuchadnezzar does his big march through the western provinces. And these things took a lot of time. And so this is next on the list of things that you're going to do after there has been a revolt. You're going to get everybody together from your entire empire to make sure they have re-sworn their loyalty, to the, loyalty oath toward to the king. Isn't that so? That's what you would do if you, would Nebi, if you were Nebuchadnezzar. What's interesting, though, is this. This is what happens. Zedekiah goes back to Jerusalem. The false prophet Hanani turns up and, re and prophesies the return of the exiles in two years. So this false prophet, he says, like, oh, the exiles, they're in Babylon. They'll all be back here in two years. Well, we have to ask ourselves the question. Hanani was a false prophet. He's making stuff up. He's the kind of prophet who sort of, you know, reads the direction that the wind is blowing. And which direction is the wind blowing in Babylon in relation to Yahweh and Yahweh's people at this time? Well, Yahweh has just been exalted. Nebuchadnezzar has just been incredibly impressed by Yahweh at the golden image. And he's just promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon at the golden image. You start to see some correlation between the two events. Okay, but there's more to it than this. So, this one's the most fascinating. Zedekiah hosts a conference in Jerusalem. You can read about this in Jeremiah 27. For envoys from the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon to plot rebellion against Babylon. Now, Zedekiah, you've just got to, he was just a loser. Um, but you have to ask yourself the question at this particular point, why did all of these great nations suddenly go, let's go to little old Judah and plot a rebellion over there? What might have caused them to focus on Judah? You see, maybe they were there at the golden image. 
And maybe they saw the power of Yahweh and they've gone, okay, we need an alliance with that God, the God who lives in that area. Because there is a God who's prepared to go up against the Babylonian gods and go toe-to-toe with them and has shown absolute power and dominance over the Babylonian gods. So if we can go over there to Judah and to Zedekiah's God and we can build an alliance there, then maybe we can take on Babylon. If you understand the psyche of how the ancients thought, you can see the possibilities of what is going on right here. Okay, what happens? The Tyranians, the Sidonians, the Judahites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, they all now send mercenaries to Egypt to aid the Egyptian cause. When they do that, what is it that is taking place? They're moving their allegiance. They're not sending their mercenaries to Babylon. They're sending them to the other superpower the rival superpower in the south. Why? Because they've found maybe there's a God here. They can form a bit of an alliance with this God and then they can aid the Egyptian cause and maybe we can take on Babylon. Well, next year, Samaticus II goes on a royal tour of Phoenicia, Palestine. He doesn't take an army. His reception is cordial and he is deep in Babylonian territory. Just shows you how far this alliance went against the Babylonians at this particular time. Now, what is most interesting about this and is is a prism that we have today that dates from the period uh, of the of the loyalty oath. And it's a prism that kind of has a whole bunch of names on it. It's kind of boring to read through it. It's called the Prism of New Western Appointments. And there's long lists carved in clay of different court officials, officials of the land, officials of town, district officials, Western vassal kings that have now been newly appointed. Why would Nebuchadnezzar need to make new appointments at this particular period? Well, there's just been insurrection. He's had to violently put down that insurrection. Then he's done his big triumphant march through there. Then he's called everybody in to swear their loyalty oath to the king. But during that insurrection, there would have been a lot of people who were killed in the Civil War and then a whole bunch of of executions that took place afterwards and cleansing of anyone and anything that may have had anything to do with that insurrection. That was how the ancients worked. And now you have to replace those people. And so this dates from the period of the loyalty oath. And so this is what would have happened. He would have replaced all of those people. And they would have been part of the group that would have come together to swear their loyalty to the king. It's interesting reading. Most of the names we've never heard of. But there's a few there that we recognize. So here are a number of notable mentions of court officials that were appointed at this particular time. You have Nabu Zari Idi Nam. In the Bible, he's called Nebuzaradan. He's the guy who goes down and burns Jerusalem after it was finally conquered for the last time. You can read about him in 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 8 to 10. You also have this guy, Nergal Sararasa, or Nergal Sarariza. He was a Babylonian official who cooperated with Nebuzaradan in, setting affair, in settling the affairs in Judah after the conquest of Jerusalem. His name appears twice in Jeremiah 39 and verse 3. Now, we just read here in Daniel chapter 3 that at the end of this whole loyalty oath that you have here at the golden image, what does it say, the last verse? Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Here they come. Hananu, Hananiah, chief of the merchants of Babylon. Adinabu, Abednego, secretary of the crown prince Amal Marduk who later becomes king and frees the captive kings of Judah. You can read about him in 2 Kings 25. And then Meshalem, or Mishael, keeper of the slave girls. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right there. Carved in clay. You see, friends, what is amazing about the Bible is this. We have barely scratched the surface of the information that is available in archaeology. You see, when archaeologists excavate... They just dig a trench. And then they, out of that trench, they, they come up with all of the information that they're trying to... You know, we, we sort of think of archaeologists, they go in and they excavate a whole city. No, they don't. They excavate a trench. Now, out of all of the possible archaeological sites in the biblical world, only 1% have ever been excavated. 
and only 1% of each site has been excavated. So that's 1% of 1% you actually get to look at, right? And then out of all of the materials that could have, well, that, that come down to us, only things that are made out of stone or baked clay, pretty much sometimes metals are preserved down to Ada. The vast majority of the artifacts have long since rotted away. So only 1% of sites have ever been excavated. Only 1% of each site has been excavated. And then only 1% of possible artifacts have survived. So that's 1% of 1% of 1%. That is a minuscule percentage. And yet we have been able to identify through archaeology over 100 individuals that are mentioned in the Bible. And not only that, with all of the archaeology we have done, there has never, ever been a single archaeological discovery that has contradicted what the Bible says. So many people say, oh, yeah, but you don't find this, and you don't find that, and you don't find the other in archaeology. Well, you just haven't dug further enough yet. What you haven't found is something that proves the Bible wrong. It just doesn't exist. Well, friends, there's one more lesson that we need to learn about Daniel chapter 3. Let's summarize Daniel chapter 3 before we finish off. Because I titled this presentation, Image to the Beast. And you're wondering, why give it that title? Okay, let's go. This is Daniel 3, let's summarize it. Nebuchadnezzar builds an image to his government. His government is a world government called Babylon. It is the superpower of its day. This World government called Babylon is a union of church and state, religion and politics together, right? Because the loyalty oath to the image was the same as the loyalty oath to Nebuchadnezzar. They were completely and perfectly united. The issue in Daniel chapter 3 is all about how you worship. It wasn't about who you claimed you worship, it's what you actually did did your actions you know they could have pretended to tie up their shoelace when the music played couldn't they I think somebody mentioned that to me the other night the penalty for not worshiping according to the decree was death that's pretty full on your obedience at that particular time defined worship you see we can say all kinds of things about worship and we can say well you know i worship god and we can say, well, what is worship? Well, I go to church and I worship. And I sing and I worship. I pray and I worship. I, I, uh, I, I, I fellowship and I worship. I spend time in nature and I worship. Whatever it might be. There are so many different ta- ways that you can worship. But you can do all of those things and still have rebellion against God in your heart. Who you truly worship is revealed by your actions. Who is most powerful in your life is revealed by, how, by what you actually do. Think about this. Has there ever been a time when you've been in a discussion with a whole bunch of secular people and you've kept your mouth shut on an issue that has been under discussion? The person who controls your speech is the person who is highest in your life. Think about that for a moment. Our actions define who we worship. The issue at stake here was the commandments of God. Thou shalt not have carved images. The righteous were saved from fire. Would we say that's a fair uh, summary of Daniel chapter 3? Okay, let's go over to Revelation chapter 13. You see, in Book of Revelation, Babylon is a major feature. And in Revelation chapter 13, I don't have time to get into this in detail, and... Uh, I'm just going to say this. Harley and I were just discussing this beforehand, uh, before this program started, because so many of you have been asking such amazing questions. And we're like, what are we going to do? Because we've just got a one-week program here. I would love to give you a verse-by-verse of Revelation 13. Don't really have time for it. And so we're looking at some options there. We might, uh, Harley, and uh, we've got Neil up the back there, um, who is the senior sage here in this church. Uh, We're looking at uh, possibilities of maybe running a small group, whatever it might be. Uh, We'll let you know more about that, but uh, here in Revelation 13, you have a beast. And the Bible says, the beast which I saw in verse 2 was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of, oh sorry, verse 1, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. You can read about that same beast in Revelation chapter 17, 
and that beast is given a name, and that name is Babylon. Right? So here you've got Babylon. Well, what have you got in verse 14? You've got a second beast who comes along, comes out of the earth rather than the sea. The Bible says he deceives those that live on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to those that live on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and yet lived. Uh Uh-oh, what have you got happening here in Revelation 13? You have an image being made to a beast. In Bible prophecy, a beast is a symbol of a nation. What's this beast called in Revelation 17? Babylon. You have an image being made to the nation of Babylon, the end time nation of Babylon. Anyone starting to see some parallels here? Yeah? He had power to to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and force as many as would not worship. What's the issue right here? Worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. Anyone starting to see any parallels? In fact, let's throw the parallels up on the screen right here so that we can see them more clearly. Here goes Revelation 13. There is an image that is created in Revelation 13. It's an image to the beast government. That is a world government. The Bible says that that world government is called Babylon. Uh, That government is a union of church and state because it is legislating worship at the end of time. And the penalty for not worshiping is death. Once again, the issue is obedience. Obedience defines who we worship. In fact, obedience is the highest form of worship because obedience involves the entire giving of your entire self to somebody else. The issue at stake is the commandments of God and the righteous at the end of time are saved from fire. Why does God record that story in Daniel chapter 3? The answer is very simple. God knows what is coming at the end of time. And God is speaking to us today. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming very, very soon. And Revelation 13 is in the process of being fulfilled right now. Wish I had time to go through it in more detail. You're going to have to ask Neil and Harley about it. And uh, they will take it through you in more detail. It will blow your mind. It will just melt your brain what you'll find in Revelation chapter 13. And how it is being fulfilled right now. One of my favorite subjects to talk about on Faith FM Breakfast Show is religious liberty. And you probably do not realize what is taking place. Religious liberty, the union of of, uh, church and state, these movements that are happening in our world is just... Religious liberty being taken away is just absolutely amazing to see how this is being fulfilled right now. What is God saying to us? God is saying this. In Daniel chapter 3, God is saying... Now, in Revelation chapter 13, by paralleling Daniel chapter 3, God is saying, like, is saying this. If you want to know how to overcome at the end of time, if you want to know how to stand firm and to survive what is coming on our world, then you need to look at Daniel chapter 3. Because that is the model. That is the example of what God is going to do at the end of time. There is a parallel between those two chapters. And the first thing that we, that we see when we see that parallel is that there were probably thousands of Jews, maybe thousands, I don't know. There would have been a very large contingent of Jews who were present there at the golden image, including Zedekiah and his whole retinue of officials. And every single one of them was flat on their face, worshipping the golden image. There were only three that were standing up, of course, Uh, Daniel would have been back in uh, Babylon. He was the prime minister. He would have been, somebody had to be there when Nebuchadnezzar was away. But there was only three that were standing up. And the three that were standing when the big issue of worship came was the three that stood when the very small issue of food was put in front of them. What's the lesson for us? If you want to stand at the end of time, it's faithfulness not just in the big things, it's faithfulness in the small things that sets us up to be faithful in the big things. But then there's another lesson that comes out, and that lesson is one that we cannot miss. 
And that lesson is when we come to the end of time and we had a discussion in our debrief this morning. And by the way, we had a lot of fun in that debrief. It was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. We're going to do it again next Saturday morning. So uh, start writing down your questions all this week long so you can bring them along to that uh, debrief and we will answer whatever questions you would like to bring along. So please uh, do that. But we had a great time there just discussing. And one of the points that we brought out was that... Well, one of, the, one of the things we, we brought out was that those who stood firm in the small things are those who stand firm in the great things. But then we looked at, okay, how does God, what does God do at the end of time? We looked at Psalms 91. Where do people hide? How do they survive? Under the shadow of the Almighty. What did Jesus do in Daniel chapter 3? He left the courts of heaven and he came down to this earth to rescue his people who were standing true for him. What's Jesus going to do at the end of time? Because he loves you so much, he's going to do exactly the same. He's going to leave the courts of heaven. He's going to say, okay, I'm coming back to this earth and I'm going to rescue my people from what the world is trying to do for them. Do you want to be, do you want to be part of that group? Yeah, it was pretty, pretty torrid time there for the three worthies for a little while, wasn't it? But imagine the experience they had. Imagine the story they had to share. I got to spend some time with Jesus. We got to have a conversation together. Yeah, it was in the burning fiery furnace, but we got to have a conversation together. Yeah? You know, friends, when we look to the future, sometimes we get scared about the future. I don't get scared about the future. And the reason I don't get scared about the future is because Jesus is coming back. And Jesus is coming back for me. He's coming back for you. And he's coming back because he loves us and because he wants to save us. Don't you want to be ready for Jesus to come back? Who wants to be ready? Yes, Praise God. We all put our hands up and we say we want to be ready. Who wants to do what it takes to be ready by making a full surrender to Jesus Christ? Yeah, I do. I do. Absolutely. It's the greatest thing you can ever do in your life, friends. May God bless you. Let's finish with prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you here this evening that we truly do serve a God who is able to deliver and to deliver us. Father, we thank you for the story of the three worthies. And as we see that story being paralleled in our day, two and a half thousand years later, we thank you that we can be a part of it again. Stay close to us and deliver us from the temptations that come our way. Prepare us for what is in the future. And we just so look forward to the day when you will return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Friends, what have we got coming up next? Psychopath to saint. Somebody actually asked the question during the debrief today. Was Nebuchadnezzar really born again? Will we really see him in heaven? We are going to read what is possibly one of the, if not the most unique chapter of the Bible. Daniel chapter 4. You can read ahead if you want, but that would be cheating. Now I know you're all going to do it, but that's all right. The only chapter of the Bible that was written, the only complete chapter of the Bible written by a non-Hebrew person and one of, one of only two personal testimonies that you find in the entire Bible. That's Daniel chapter 4. It is absolutely astounding what God does in chapter 4. That's going to be our subject for tomorrow night. I look forward to joining you all here again tomorrow night. May God bless you in a very special way, and we will see you back again tomorrow.